The Scottish Government's introduced new legislation to reform hate crime law and also to introduce a hate speech law. And this proposed legislation is confused, politicised, sexist and at some points just quite bizarre. And it's obviously a serious threat to freedom of speech. So in this video, I'm going to have a really thorough look at the issue, right from the ideology to behind it, right to the nuts and bolts of the proposed law. So sit back and be amazed and be very worried. Point number one, the Scottish Government doesn't really care about hate. Now in this video, I'm going to refer to various documents. I'll refer to the law itself. I'll also refer to some of the associated documentation that the government's published to explain it. So here, listen to this. A cohesive society is one with a common vision and a sense of belonging for all communities. A society in which the diversity of people's backgrounds, beliefs and circumstances are appreciated and valued. What do you think of that? I, I just don't get that. Appreciate and value the diversity of people's backgrounds. So if I meet, meet someone from Nigeria, I'm supposed to think, I really appreciate and value the fact that you're from Nigeria. If I meet someone from Glasgow, I'm supposed to think, I really appreciate and value the fact that you're from Glasgow. I mean, I'm originally from England. Is everyone supposed to say, oh, I really appreciate and value the fact that you're from England? I, I just don't think like that. Other aspects of backgrounds. So if someone says, you know, I'm working class, we're supposed to all think, oh, I really appreciate and value that. If someone said, I'm from an aristocratic family. We're all supposed to say, we really appreciate and value that. I just don't think like that. I mean, do you? You just focus on the individual. I mean, you value and appreciate most people, but it's not because of their background. I mean, there's some people you don't particularly like. You don't find they're particularly helpful people either. But again, it's nothing to do with their background. Anyway, carrying on. We're supposed to appreciate and value everyone's beliefs. So... Am I supposed to appreciate the fact that some people are atheists? Are atheists supposed to value the fact that I'm a Christian? It just doesn't make any sense. Why should one person have to value the fact that someone believes things that they think are not true? I just don't get that. I mean, are we supposed to appreciate and value someone's racist beliefs? I mean, if you're at university, are you supposed to appreciate and value the fact that your lecturer might be a revolutionary communist? I mean, why? I mean, are Scottish nationalists supposed to value and appreciate unionist beliefs and vice versa? Does the Scottish government value and appreciate the beliefs of a Muslim that same-sex marriage is wrong? I mean, it's just nonsense, isn't it? Right, the last thing, we're supposed to value and appreciate everybody's circumstances. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, take it, for example, you, you've got like a, a throuple, three people in a relationship living together? Am I supposed to appreciate and value their circumstances? If you've got a family where mum and dad are both drug, drug addicts, I mean, are we supposed to value and appreciate those people's circumstances? I just don't get it. But what do they, do they really mean? What the Scottish government thinks is that we all need to be nice to each other. Okay, no one's going to disagree with that. But their assumption is that where not niceness comes from is a lack of appreciation of diversity, that's the fount of all evil when it comes to hatred and, and division in uh, society. So they assume the main source of hatred is lack of appreciation of diversity and they choose particular selected minority groups to focus on in this regard. So when the Scottish government did their anti-hate, anti-bigotry campaign a couple of years ago, it was all about the usual things about like sexism, so-called homophobia, so-called transphobia, etc. It wasn't about some of the things that really do cause hatred and division in Scottish society. For example, independence and unionism. Um, if you look at, say, any article in a newspaper about, say, I don't know, a cat stuck up in a tree, it won't be long before in the comments thread there'll be uh, nationalists and unionists calling each other everything under the sun. And it really does seem quite hateful, some of it. In Scotland as well, I mean, football. Football and the sectarian element, but you know, football, there's some real hatred and nastiness surrounding people's views about football. I mean, my personal socially conservative views result in me being called all sorts of things uh, quite routinely. So hatred is not unusual in these other uh, contexts. And what those Scottish governments imagining by hatred, I think often they're, they're thinking about 
the sort of person who gets you know, abuse hurled at them when they're just walking around going about their everyday life, you know, in the street. But that happens to other people as well. What about if the person who's known to be an alcoholic, might the local kids shout something at them? Probably. Or a drug addict. Or someone who just looks really, you know, scruffy and a bit dirty. Someone whose appearance is, is a bit odd in some way. What about their political views? And we had an SMP, uh, I think it was Alan Smith, so sort of bragging uh, about the fact that, you know, some people hurl abuse at representatives of other political parties. I mean, who actually does this, this, this sort of abusing, expresses this, this alleged hatred? I mean, in some cases, it is just you know, people who are a bit horrible. Sometimes it's people who are drunk. Sometimes as well, it's people who are mentally ill in some way. I mean, a few years ago, I was riding my bike along the canal in Edinburgh, just going through uh, Fountain Bridge, and there was a group of teenagers on bikes, and I went through the middle of them, and one of them spat at me. This was uh, quite shocking. So I turned around and chased them, and they all ran off, uh, all cycled off on their bikes. Now, had I have been a, of a different race, then the Scottish government would have encouraged me to see that as a racist incident. If I'd, have happened to be, if I'd have happened to be wearing a dress at the time, they would have classed that as a transphobic incident. They would encourage me to think of it in those sort of ways. But because it was just little or me, then obviously it's not some sort of special hatred. That, that was just you know, some kids uh, you know, being a bit of a pain. But the Scottish government operates from its cultural Marxist narrative by which i mean they've taken on the idea that in society there are basically two types of people there's oppressors and there are oppressed groups and the job of the government is to liberate the oppressed groups from oppression partly so that they'll vote for you and support your wider cause so when the scottish government talks about tackling hatred they're not interested in hatred in general they're only interested in hatred related to these particular oppressed groups that they've identified. So you hear about the so-called protected characteristics. People say that as though it's some sort of sacred uh, item. They're the sacred protected characteristics. And everyone knows what's really meant by them. I mean, when it says sexuality, they mean LGBT people. When it says sex, they mean women. I mean, trans, obviously. When they say race, they mean black and minority ethnic. When they say religion, they mean minority religions. Now obviously real hatred does exist towards people in these groups, but the Scottish government is only interested in hatred towards these groups. So the question we can ask ourselves, is the Scottish government is interested in tackling hatred, or is it interested in advancing a political agenda? And the answer is it's advancing a political agenda because it's only interested in hate that fits in with their culturally Marxist political theory. So if you want to stir up hatred towards other groups or individuals or your political enemies, then that's fine. They're not interested in that uh, at all. Now, if you think about this as having a, its root in Marxist thoughts, I'm not saying the Scottish government are Marxists. I'm just saying that a lot of their thinking is influenced by uh, intellectuals who are sympathetic uh, to Marxism at the very least. Now, um, in the United, uh, the USSR, they were very keen on anti-racist, anti-sexist, policies. But on the other hand, if you didn't agree with them politically, or if you were uh, rich as well, then you'd find yourself sent off to the gulag. And the very idea of hate speech originates from communist countries. I mean, it was originally proposed back in, I think it was uh, early 1960s, uh, on a, an international level. Then the Western democracies opposed it, while the communist countries uh, were pushing to have it introduced. And the Western democracies won, basically, so it was pushed back. But now we've come full circle and it's now Western democracies that are introducing hate speech legislation. So the Scottish government could try to tackle hate, but no, they only try to tackle certain hates that fit in with their political narrative, which is uh, culturally uh, Marxist. Right, point number two, hate crime. We've already got hate crime legislation. What's it all about? Well, basically it's there to pander to certain victim groups because other sorts of hate don't matter, apparently. So it creates a hierarchy of victims. So some victims of crime get special treatment. The police prioritise the investigation, for example. So if an old lady is attacked for a pension, that's really not that important. Uh, but if a man has been beaten up uh, and he thinks it was because he was gay, then that's obviously top of the priorities 
for the police. This whole idea of hate crime, by the way, the Conservatives totally on board for it. They haven't objected to it uh, in any way. I mean, this is again from the documentation. Hate crime legislation makes it clear that such behaviour is not acceptable and sends a message to victims, perpetrators and wider society that hate crime is not acceptable and will not be tolerated. Well, I think that just shows how empty the whole thing is. Did anyone really think it was OK to go and print someone? before the hate crime legislation came along. Did anyone really think it was okay to go and you know kick someone in a wheelchair because they thought somehow you were allowed to, to do that to disabled people? And only when the hate crime legislation came along did they realize that that was not acceptable. I mean, it's just nonsense, isn't it? Well, the hate crime, you have to commit an existing crime. And then if they think the reason you committed it was some sort of prejudice against that group of people, then it will be treated more seriously. You could end up with a, uh, a greater punishment for it. So it sends a message that cer to certain groups that they're getting special treatment from the police, from the legal system, ultimately from the government. So going back to my issue uh, where I spat at on my bike. So if, I, if I'd have happened to have been wearing a dress at the time, let's say, then and, and out of court, the boy who did it, then let's say they fined him £200 but then added on an extra £100 because they decided it was a transphobic hate crime. So he's fined £300 altogether, 200 for spitting, 100 for his bad attitude to, uh, to men wearing dresses. See. So part of the punishment has not been for a crime, it's been for the, for the thought that accompanied it. Now, if you think about that, if that's your logic, then how about the person who do doesn't spit at someone but still has the bad thoughts about trans people. Well, logically, it obviously makes sense. If having the bad thoughts is worth £100 fine without committing the crime, then if someone just has the bad thoughts, then surely they should be worth punishing as well. That follows logically. But how do you know someone has these bad thoughts? How do you know someone harbours this so-called hatred? Well, you listen to what they say. So therefore, you end up with the idea of hate speech legislation. So the Conservatives, they've gone along with the hate crime legislation, which logically, inevitably leads to hate speech uh, legislation. And here we are. So the government's new bill is its not really changing particularly the hate crime legislation. It's just consolidating it, putting it all in one place instead of it being scattered around uh, through different bills. But that's where we are with that. Right, number three, hate incidents. Just a little aside, just to give you the complete picture again. We already have the law that enables hate incidents to be recorded. So if you were to pick up the phone and phone up the police and report something as a hate incident, doesn't matter what, the police will automatically record it as a hate incident. It's entirely subjective, but they will only record it if it relates to one of the sacred protected characteristics. So it's not any old hate, it's only hate that fits in with the cultural Marxist agenda. And the police are incredibly biased about this. They get so much equality and diversity training that they're trained just to assume that a person with one of the special protected characteristics automatically deserves a, um, a special treatment. So you record their thing, you know, sympathize with them, and that's that. Uh, what this results in is competing victim groups then try and outdo each other in the number of hate incidents they can get recorded. So if you imagine you work for, say, the Scottish Trans Alliance, so you want government funding. What's one of the arguments to get government funding? Well, the amount of hate there is towards trans people. So what do you want? You want lots of people reporting hate incidents and saying they're transphobic. And if you can get enough of them, then you'll get your funding for next year. So these organizations are forever saying, look, here's the phone number. Please phone the police. Please report something for us. And people do. So when the numbers go up, they can say, oh, look, in a very serious issue still. And again, that's to refer to our friends in the Conservative Party. Again, they're totally on board for this and they haven't opposed it at all. I mean, my personal story, um, I've got a hate incident recorded about me because I said that children need a mum and a dad ideally. Therefore, I don't think same sex parenting is ideal. So the police recorded that as a hate incident. They also then produced a hate concern form that they then uh, released and ended up at my school where I was working. So my employer received this form saying hate concern, child concern, because I said I think kids need a mum and a dad, ideally. Anyway, that's hate incidents. Right, back to uh, the new bill. Number four, 
So I've explained the logic. If you agree with the logic of hate crime, it inevitably leads to hate speech. Because if you're punishing the thoughts, apart from the crime, if the thoughts are there without the crime, surely you should punish them as well. So in Scotland, what they've decided to call their hate speech legislation, they've decided to actually um, say that it's about stirring up hatred. And this is what the proposed law actually says. A person commits an offence if the person behaves in a threatening or abusive manner or communicates threatening or abusive material to another person. Now, it's worth noting at this point, this threatening and abusive manner, this threatening and abusive material, it doesn't have to be uh, racist or homophobic, transphobic, whatever. There doesn't actually need to be any reference at all to the sacred protected characteristics in what you say or do. Okay? So it's just be threatening or abusive and either in doing so the person intends to stir up hatred against a group of persons based on the group being defined by reference to a characteristic mentioned in subsection three. That's the sacred protected characteristics or two. As a result, it's likely that hatred will be stirred up against such a group. So what we've got there, so you'd be threatening and abusive, and then if you intended that to stir up hatred, then you're guilty. If you didn't intend it to stir up hatred, you could still be guilty if they decide uh, that it probably would have stirred it up as well. Now, in their notes, they explain why they didn't say you have to be intending to stir up hatred. They said that might be difficult to prove. So if it's difficult to prove, why not just say, okay, you don't, let's not bother proving it then. Let's say... Uh, doesn't matter whether you intended to or not, you're guilty. So the protected characteristics are age, disability, religion, or in the case of a social or cultural group, perceived religious affiliation, sexual orientation, transgender identity, variations in sex characteristics. Now, all the ones related to race and nationality are not there. And the reason for that is they've got a separate bit, which, which is pretty well the same. But the only difference is when it comes to a different race or nationality, um, it says you, if you behave in a threatening, abusive, or insulting manner. So insulting is included as well. Now that seems a bit odd. You might think, well, why would they, they be different? And they explain in the notes, they say the reason they've left insulting there is because the old legislation used to have the word, word insulting. And they thought if they took it out, people might take that to mean that they're now saying it's okay to be insulting towards people on the grounds of their race. I mean, you can imagine a couple of uh, racist thugs sitting in the pub saying, oh, have you read the latest, the latest legislation? Have you noticed the word insulting is gone? I think that probably means we can go out and be insulting now. I mean, I don't know what they're imagining. Anyway, so that's why they've left insulting in. But of course, they haven't really thought this through. But if you have the law saying about being insulting on the grounds of race, but it doesn't say it, about all the other things, what does it imply? The government seems to be saying it's okay to be insulting on the grounds of age or disability or sexual orientation or transgender identity or whatever. So I'm not sure that's been thought through very well uh, at all, to say the least. Obviously, it's only the protected characteristics. If you want to stir up hate on any other grounds, then it's open season. So if it's to do with politics or football teams or if it's hatred of the rich or of an individual, then that's all fair game, just as long as it's not the sacred protected characteristics. Right, the next part in the bill. It is a defence for a person charged with an offence under this section to show that the behaviour or the communication of the material was in the particular circumstances reasonable. Okay, now if you look at other similar legislation in England and Wales uh, and other legislation in Scotland, this little section here is that it's copied from other laws and they've put it in. Does it really make sense? So what it's saying is basically if you have actually done the things that have been named above, you can have the defense that actually it was reasonable in the circumstances. Okay, so let's think of an example. So let's say you behaved in a threatening and abusive manner, um, intending to stir up hatred against disabled people. So the law says that it can be a defense to say that in those particular circumstances, it was reasonable to be threatening and abusive with the intention of stirring up hatred towards disabled people. 
I mean, have they thought this through at all? It doesn't seem like it. Now, if you look at this whole thing, when they talk about hate speech, they want you to imagine th ridiculous things like, remember someone sort of putting leaflets around for punish a Muslim day or something like that, urging people, inciting people to commit crimes against Muslims, basically. That would already be a crime. But that's the sort of thing they're trying to get you to think about in terms of this hate, uh, stirring up hatred legislation. But let's just have a look at the terminology. What does it, would it actually cover? I mean, what's hate? Dislike? Disapproval? But at the moment in our society, we're in the midst of a language arm race, arms race, where people are taking what used to be really severe, extreme language, and they're applying it to more and more situations. I mean, routinely, uh, the Scottish Family Party would be accused of hating women, hating gays, hating trans people, which is all complete nonsense, but that's a normal use of the word in our society. So when you've got a jury made up of normal people, then who knows how they're going to interpret hatred. I mean, here's just a, a little example from when I was over in, in Lewis uh, a year ago. Um, this is a report from a newspaper. Hebridean Pride supporters have been carrying out a private campaign of messages to all three of the proposed venues, explaining their view that the Scottish Family Party spreads hatred and division. So if this um, stirring up hatred legislation was in place, they wouldn't have just have been phoning the hotels and the community centres, they would have phoned the police. Okay? Would you trust the police to be reasonable and just dismiss that out of hand? No. I would imagine at the very least the police would say, oh, well, we'll investigate that. So then that, that would hang over you for a period. That would be the story then. Scottish Family Party being investigated for stirring up hatred. Great headline that is, isn't it? Uh, but that's the, uh, the way it would cast aspersions on people. Okay, I'm looking further at the wording of the offence. Being threatening or abusive, uh, not necessarily insulting. Okay, that sounds quite reassuring. Doesn't it? You could think, oh, I would never be threatening or abusive. But what does abusive mean? Let's have a look in the dictionary. A few definitions. Using harsh, insulting language. Using or containing insulting or hurtful language. Insulting? Hurtful? So they've taken the word insulting out, but actually, according to, to some dictionary definitions, the word abusive includes insulting and also hurtful. Cambridge English Dictionary, definition of insulting, rude or offensive. Okay, so offence. Right, definition of hatred. Uh, Lord Brackadale, who did the review for the Scottish Government on this issue, he said, hate crime is a term used to describe behaviour which is both criminal and rooted in prejudice. So he seems to be saying hate and prejudice are synonyms, almost. Prejudice is hatred. Hatred is prejudice. Um, so, I mean, I've said I, I don't approve of same-sex parenting. I don't think it's ideal. The General Teaching Council for Scotland are on my case because they're saying that's prejudiced. But according to Lord Brackadale, prejudiced and hateful, they seem to be about the same thing. So when it says stirring up hatred, because that really just means stirring up prejudice, it seems like uh, it would. Dictionary definitions of hatred intense dislike or extreme aversion or hostility or Cambridge English Dictionary an extremely strong feeling of dislike so it doesn't necessarily have to include any ill will just dislike so using those dictionary definitions stirring up hatred we could uh, rephrase it like this it could be using hurtful language likely to stir up an extremely strong feeling of dislike, even if you didn't mean it to. Or hurtful language likely to stir up prejudice, even if you didn't mean it to. Okay, that sounds pretty broad, doesn't it? So all I've done there is I've replaced the terminology in the bill with some of their dictionary definitions. Uh, that's a perfectly rational, logical thing to do if you're trying to understand the meaning of something, and you can see how concerning that is. Uh, at this point, I'll just read a, a couple of excerpts from a book, uh, a very short quotations. The book censored by uh, Paul Coleman, uh, How European Hate Speech Laws Are Threatening Freedom of Speech. I actually met Paul at an event in Edinburgh 
a few months ago. Very interesting fella. But let's look at this. Uh, this is from a fact sheet from the European Court of Human Rights. The identification of expressions that could be qualified as hate speech is sometimes difficult because this kind of speech does not necessarily manifest itself through the expression of hatred or of emotions. It can also be concealed in statements which at first glance may seem to be rational or normal. And now this is a quote from the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, it states that the term hate speech, as used in this section, includes a broader spectrum of verbal acts, including disrespectful public discourse. It also laments in another paper that there is currently no adequate EU binding instrument aimed at effectively countering expression of negative opinions. Now in Scotland, they're never happier than when they're doing as they're told by a supranational organization. So this will be heavily influential on them, whether we're in the EU or not. I think they'll be listening to these voices. Now I mentioned earlier on that the idea of hate speech legislation was basically pushed by communist countries earlier on. Just listen to this when it was first put forward to the United Nations. The voting record does indeed make for interesting reading. From a European's perspective, the nations that voted against Article 22, that was a hate speech uh, law, were all the democracies. Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, Iceland, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, the United Kingdom. Conversely, those in favour of prohibiting hate speech were all being run by communist regi regimes, with the exception of Spain, which was under the dictatorship of Francisco Franco at the time. So who voted for it? Albania, Bulgaria, Belarus, Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Spain, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, USSR and Yugoslavia. Just to further illustrate the way people understand um, hate speech, this is a quote from an article that was published in the Huffington Post. It was back in 2013. Listen to this. Sometimes hate speech isn't direct at all. It may even be a little bit involved. Consider, for example, how anti-LGBTQ organisations use, use the word family. First of all, it's rather striking how many of these organisations have appropriated the word family as part of their name. The list includes the American Family Association, the Family Research Council, the Family Research Institute, Family Watch International, Focus on the Family, Illinois Family Institute, United Families International, as well as the Family Policy Council and the National Organization for Marriage and the Traditional Values Coalition. Define the family as an exclusively heterosexual social unit. Their use of the word family and the phrase traditional family values is itself a form of hate speech. So all people who think like that, and there's plenty of them, they'll be reporting people to the police left, right and center, and the push will be towards uh, classing that sort of thing as hate speech. Anyway, right, moving towards a, a little comparison with the law in England. Now, this is from the Scottish government's documentation about stirring up hatred. In particular, for those stirring up offences in England and Wales, which apply in respect of religion and sexual orientation, the conduct or material requires to be threatening rather than threatening, abusive or insulting. In addition, it's necessary to prove that the accused intended to stir up hatred, a factor that the accused actions would be likely to result in hatred being stirred up is not sufficient. In other words, the law in England is better than the law in Scotland. Okay, now, because to be threatening is obviously a much narrower thing than threatening, abusive or insulting. And also, in the English law, you, they have to prove intent Whereas in Scotland, they say that's a bit difficult, so they just won't bother uh, with that bit. So the Scottish government also says this. It's recognised that during the Scottish government consultation on reforming hate crime legislation in Scotland, concerns were expressed by some consultees about what constitutes abusive behaviour, as it involves a degree of subjective judgment. However, it's worth highlighting that the term abusive is one that Scottish courts are very familiar with. One example, for example, through the offence, threatening or abusive behaviour, Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. 
with, for example, 3,759 convictions uh, for that, etc. So they're saying that other laws clarify what abusive means. Right, let's have a look at one that they quoted. So this law apparently cl clarifies the definition of abusive. So person A commits an offence if uh, A behaves in a threatening or abusive manner and the behaviour would be likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear or alarm. That is not the definition that's used in the proposed stirring up hatred crime. So they're saying this law defines what uh, threatening and abusive is, but it doesn't. Because in this law, the law itself explains what it means. It says the behaviour will be likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear or alarm. That's the threshold for it being considered threatening or abusive. In the proposed law, that threshold is not there at all. This will left entirely subjective. But then they refer to this sort of law, saying that this clarifies it. But it doesn't make any sense at all. So whereas this law seems more reasonable, suffer fear and alarm, the proposed one is not. Much more vague and subjective and open to misinterpretation. Penalty for stirring up hatred, maximum prison term of seven years or a fine or both. Right, number five, moving on through the bill, we now get to a section about offences of possessing inflammatory material. And this is possessing literature, for example, that if it were to be communicated, it would stir up hatred against a group. Now, let's just imagine an example of that. Let's take a common piece of literature that a lot of people have in their homes, uh, the Bible. And it says in it, uh, this, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Right, if we ask someone from Stonewall whether that was offensive, whether or not it was prejudiced, whether or not it stirred up hatred, you can imagine they'd say, yes, 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 yes. And so we can assume that any literature that expresses similar views to that is going to be in danger of being criminalised. And again, just possessing it can be the problem. And the bill also outlines the police's power of entry to break into a building in order to search for this sort of literature. And so, I mean, are they going to kick down the door, doors of churches and take the Bibles? Well, no, because they realise they'd be in hot water for that. But you'd suspect a lot of people actually like to do that, but they won't go for, like, the Bible, because that'd be too hot to handle. They'll go and try and pick off individuals, individual publications, one by one. Then the chilling effect will be felt more widely. Right, number six, the bill talks about individual culpability where an organisation commits an offence talks about you know, if a, a play is performed, then it's not just the actor who gets sent to prison, potentially, it's also the director of the play. And, and it's also within organisations more widely. Basically, what it's trying to do is it's trying to promote paranoia. So saying if someone in your organisation does something that uh, you know, it, 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 uh, stirs up hatred, then it could be you that finds yourself in court. So it's going to encourage in organisations a real play safe attitude. They're going to be paranoid and just going to steer clear of anything remotely controversial or anyone who might be remotely controversial. So when it comes to the arts now, if you're on message with the SNP, you get a grant. They'll give you thousands to put on your performance, even though no one might want to come and watch it. Um, if your performance is not quite on message with the SNP, then you might find yourself in prison. Right, number seven, the bill makes provision for the protection of freedom of expression. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, but, well, let's see what it says. So, with regards to religion, behavioural material is not to be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that it involves or includes a discussion or criticism of religion, whether religions generally or a particular group, religious beliefs or practices, proselytising or urging persons to cease practising their religion. Now, I think it's quite concerning when a law starts telling you what you're allowed to say. 
because that starts implying that are you actually allowed to say anything other than that? So that is quite worrying. But that doesn't cover a whole lot of things. I mean, does that cover someone saying that someone's religious beliefs are dangerous? Like Richard Dawkins says to Christians, your beliefs are dangerous. You know, you're indoctrinating children with them, and that's a form of child abuse. Okay? If you were to describe a set of religious doctrines or a religious tradition as evil, lots of people do to Christians, some people do to other religious traditions as well, or oppressive, how about if you were to ridicule it or to insult or mock religious figures? That is very definitely not included in this freedom of speech uh, provision. Now, they're obvious things to include, aren't they? They're the sort of things that are the hot topics. They're the things that people would claim to are stirring up hatred. And so despite the, an obvious need to include that, if you actually wanted to protect that sort of speech, it's not there. So I would assume from that that the Scottish government is actually intending to, outdo, uh, to outlaw for example, ridiculing and harshly criticising religious beliefs, religious figures. All right, moving on with the so-called freedom of expression protections. Sexual orientation. Behavioural material is not to be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that it involves or includes discussion or criticism of sexual conduct or practices or urging persons to refrain from or modify sexual conduct or practices. Again, that's a pretty narrow range of views to express. Would that cover someone saying that they think homosexual sex is evil or degenerate or disgusting or the perversion or opposing to same opposing same sex parenting or objecting to same sex marriage or urging people to take steps to change their sexuality? Um, well, who knows? But you'd assume the fact that they're not included, even though it might be obvious to include those things, you can assume that they're deliberately intending that those things would be um, under suspicion under the law. Now, again, let's compare to the similar law in England. For the similar law, let's say sexual orientation, there's a protection of freedom of expression. And the first part says, for the avoidance of doubt, the discussion or criticism of sexual conduct or practices or the urging of persons to refrain from or modify such conduct or practices shall not be taken of itself to be threatening or intending to stir up hatred. In other words, that's more or less word for word identical to the Scottish one. In other words, they've copied it. So the Scottish government has copied the English legislation and just, just put it in. But in the English one, it then says this, for the avoidance of doubt, any discussion or criticism of marriage which concerns the sex of the parties to the marriage shall not in itself be taken to uh, be threatening or intended to stir up hatred. So in England, there's an additional freedom of expression defence which says criticising same-sex marriage, effectively, is OK. In Scotland, they've deliberately decided to miss that out. Deliberately. They've cut and pasted the first part and deliberately left out the second part. Why could that be? The only reason why they could do that is because they are intending to classify criticism of same-sex marriage as stirring up hatred. Right, if you were writing this law, you were wanting to put in um, freedom of speech reassurances, what else would you put in? You'd obviously want to put in reassurances that you can criticise the ideology of transgenderism. Zero. Not mentioned at all. They could have put something in that says... Um, it won't be taken to be stirring up hatred just because you say trans women are not women. But it doesn't say that. Um, can you say a man dressed as a woman looks ridiculous? Can you say transgenderism is a mental health problem? These are common views that are held in society. It would have been obvious to include them in a free speech uh, reassurance section. But there's no reassurance section with regard to alleged transphobia issues. There's one more reference to freedom and rights in the Scottish Government's documentation. This is referring to the uh, European Convention of Human Rights. Article 9, protect your right to freedom of thought, belief and religion. The Scottish Government says this. It is accepted that the provisions of the bill may also result in interferences with the rights to manifest religion under Article 9 of the Convention. For instance, in relation to proselytising. However, an interference with the rights to manifest religion is lawful where the interference 
is prescribed by law and is necessary in a democratic society in the interests of specified legitimate aims. These aims include the need to protect the rights of others, to protect public order. Uh, the Scottish Government is of the view that, given the harms caused by prejudice-based offending, it is proportionate for there to be limited interference with Article 9 rights, where that is to protect public order and the rights of others from the stirring up of hatred. Well, at least they're honest. So they're saying that, yes, this bill does infringe on your rights to freedom of thought, belief and religion, in particular in relation to proselytising. In other words, if you're, for example, a Christian who's going to, in the process of urging someone to convert to your faith, um, says something related to one of the protected characteristics, then they're, they're making it quite clear that, well, you've lost that right. You can't do that anymore in certain circumstances relating to certain issues. Okay, part eight. There's a section in the bill, offences relating to stirring up hatred relating to information society services. Now, I'm guessing this is to do with social media, uh, electronic storage of information, etc. To be honest, I didn't understand this section, but someone who does understand it needs to get into this because I suspect it might have to do with frightening, for example, social media organisations by making them feel that they're somehow responsible for what people put on them. Obviously, they can't police it, so what would they do? They would just start blanket bans for all sorts of groups, people, words, etc. So if you've got the expertise to understand that section, let me know what you make of it. Right, on to number nine, blasphemy. This law abolishes a previous blasphemy law that existed in Scotland, which protected the Christian faith from criticism, Christian teachings from criticism. Well, to be honest, it wasn't particularly against criticism. It was against, like, gratuitously offensive criticism. But there were two problems with it. Number one, it restricted freedom of speech in a way that it shouldn't have uh, been done. And the other problem was it was biased, it was asymmetrical. It wasn't fair. It restricted criticism of Christianity, whereas if you criticised other religions or atheism, then that was okay. So obviously that's not fair, is it? So that was abolished. But obviously the point can be made that with this new hate speech legislation, that's like blasphemy law 2.0 coming in. So the blasphemy law it protected Christians, but not Hindus, uh, Muslims, etc. That's obviously unfair. I mean, it's asymmetrical. No one would ever think of coming up with a law like that now, would they? I mean, that would just be ridiculous. Oh, let's move on to the next one. Number 10. Sex, gender. Obviously sex, gender. They're obviously protected, sacred protected characteristics. They'd be in all the lists of those characteristics. But there's been no mention of them so far. Here's why. Right. While Lord Brackerdale, in his review of hate crime legislation, recommended that gender should be added to the hate crime law, leading women's organisations were strongly opposed to this approach. They proposed a standalone offence of misogynistic harassment be developed, which the Scottish Government is committed to in principle. A working group will be established to take this forward and consider how the criminal justice system deals with misogyny. OK, have you got that? In other words, no crime of stirring up hatred against men, no hate crime by women against men, but very definitely they want a crime of stirring up hatred against women or hate crime against women. Now, that is obviously unbelievable that that's what they've decided to do. But the government just kowtows to the taxpayer-funded feminists. I mean, this sort of ideology dominates the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon herself is a female supremacist. So what rationale do they give for wanting this skewed law that's effectively a one-way street in favour of women? Well, you could say, you know, why are Scotland's fanatically anti-male feminists so terrified about a law against stirring up hatred against men? Well, the facetious answer could, would be because they're worried they'd get prosecuted under it. But let's look at what they have to say about it. This is from a, a government website. Creating an intersectional gender architecture, the status of women in Scotland structures an intersectionality, gender-based violence. The Scottish Government defines gender-based violence as follows. Gender-based violence is a function of gender inequality and an abuse of male power and privilege. 
It takes the form of actions that result in physical, sexual and psychological harm or suffering to women and children or affronts to their human dignity, including threats of such acts, coercion or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or private life. Now, obviously, we all agree that violence, these other sorts of behaviour are bad, but are they all caused by inequality? Are they all results of a power imbalance? So in other words, on this ideology, every rape committed is not driven by a sex drive. It's all to do with the power inequality between men as a group and women as a group. So in order to tackle rape, you've got to have more female MSPs. You can't solve one without the other. It's all part of the same problem, apparently, which it obviously isn't, but that's what they believe. Right, that's what else the government's got to say. A number of women's organisations have stated that a statutory aggravation based on sex would undermine the narrative of equally safe and that it would be unhelpful to label only some gendered offences have been aggravated by prejudice based on sex when their view is that they are all inherently a product of misogyny. So every gender-based crime is automatically a product of misogyny. So are they saying here that every crime committed by a man against a woman, a woman is misogynistic? In other words, it's automatically a hate crime. So if I sat here at my computer and came up with some sort of credit card fraud and I conned a woman out of some money, that would actually be a misogynistic hate crime driven by uh, hatred of women and it was to do with the power inequality between men as a group and women as a group. Now that obviously is absolutely stupid. But that's not to say it's not what they mean. But what do they mean by a gendered offence? Is it an offence that's committed by men against women more than by women against men? I mean, that could be any crime virtually. Men in general commit more crime. So, so what do they mean by gender-based violence? I couldn't find a very accurate definition from the Scottish Government, but I found one from the EU, which, I mean, it's all part of the same blob. I mean, what they think will be, will be very similar. Gender-based violence is violence directed against a person because of that person's gender or violence that affects persons of a particular gender disproportionately. So therefore, domestic violence affects women more than it affects men. So then by this logic, using that word in the loosest sense, that means any domestic violence against a woman is automatically a hate crime. So it's not just one bloke being drunk and getting angry with his wife and hitting her. It's a reflection of the power inequalities between men and women and he's really misogynistic and he hates women, whatever. It's automatically a hate crime. Whereas, if a woman attacks a man in the home while she says, I hate men, that can't be a hate crime because it's, it's a woman against a man. That, that, there's just, that, that just can't exist. There's only misogynistic hate crime, according to these uh, advisors. Even if a particular crime has never in the history of the world been committed by a woman against a man, surely there's got to be the possibility that it will be in the future, unless it's biologically impossible, so the law shouldn't discriminate. I mean, this is just pure madness. It's as crazy as saying, right, men do most of speeding. 76% of speeding fines are given to men. So therefore, the law should say, Men are not allowed to speed, and we'll find them if they do. We won't bother about women, because there's less of them. For the people who are pushing this, they've got a sort of anti-men, they demonise men, they've got a battle of, men's, uh, battle of the sexes mentality. They would see this as striking a blow against men, because women are the oppressed group, men are the oppressors, as groups, not individuals, as groups. So when a member of an oppressor group called men commits a crime against a member of an oppressed group, called women, that is an act of oppression, automatically. And that madness is being enshrined in Scottish law. That's the way the Scottish Government is saying it's going to head. Now, the vast majority of women in Scotland don't believe this junk. But it seems like most of the ones who do are either in the Scottish Government, paid by the Scottish Government, in other political parties in the Scottish Parliament, working for the BBC or lecturing at universities. I mean, imagine having the power to skew the law like that, to suggest something that's so obviously unfair and ridiculous and to just have it accepted by the government. I mean, it's like if they were looking at a, a hate crime motivated by football 
And the Celtic fan club came along and said, no, 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 we don't want that. We just want a hate crime about hate crime uh, motivated by hatred of Celtic. That's all we want. And the government said, OK, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. We'll have a hate crime that can only be crimes against Celtic fans. But that's what the government's doing. I mean, these feminist extremists that are pushing this line, what's their idea of stirring up misogynistic hatred? We can look forward to seeing what they come up with from their hardline anti-male feminist extreme viewpoint. And whatever they come up with will be accepted by the government. Will the Conservative Party fight against it? Risk a bit of controversy? Risk upsetting some of the feminists in the Parliament? I don't think so. Forget it. Now, one of the things you have to do when with a bill in the Scottish Parliament is there has to be some impact assessments done to try and look at some of the consequences they can foresee of the law. And one of them is an equality impact assessment. So they have to look at this law and see if it had any implications for equality. So they're looking at a law here that's blatantly, plainly sexist, and they're asked to assess it to see if it has any implications for equality. What's it they had to say? No comment. I mean, the blindness is just staggering. Well, so to conclude, the whole hate crime, hate incident, hate speech bundle, we would just ditch the lot. It's all flawed from the very beginning, uh, dangerous to society. But the hate speech in particular, what would it result in? It would result in a lot of people plain safe with what they said. It would chill debate. People might be at their keyboard, ready to express their opinion, but they just think, ooh, you know, maybe I'd better not, just in case. Or they might say it, but then their partner might say, oh, you don't want to be saying that. You, know, you don't want to, for you to end up being fined or in prison. So they think, oh, okay, I won't say it. That's a really negative effect in society. What other consequences would there be of this stirring up hatred offence? There would be some grave injustices. People will find themselves being fined or imprisoned for expressing perfectly reasonable opinions. That could be me, it could be other people as well. The other thing it will do, it will yet further embolden the sort of aggressive activists that currently have the police bending over backwards to do everything they can for them, and the government as well. So, I mean, anyone with any axe to grind, they'll just be reporting to the police again, again, and again, things that they don't like. I mean, imagine Stonewall. I mean, they'll be at it daily reporting things uh, to the police on this ground. Now, even if someone isn't actually uh, convicted of this, the process is the punishment. It will take months to sort out. It will cost lots of money. The damage to your reputation will be very significant. You know, headline, Richard Lucas charged with stirring up hatred. Okay, I mean, it's just really damaging to people's reputations. And they know that. And they know that this process will be the punishment as well. The other thing I would think will happen is people who feel they've got special protection could go into uh, an argument with someone. They could be really cocky and aggressive and provocative. They could say the most vile and offensive things to another person. But if they can provoke the other person to just retaliate with something related to one of the sacred protected characteristics, they could then say, right, gotcha. I, re I recorded that on my phone. That's a hate crime. That was stirring up hatred. I'm going to report that to the police. And they may very well find that the police take that seriously and that goes to court. I mean, the upshot of all this is as a result of this law, we will live in a less open and a less democratic society. Less open because views can't be discussed and less democratic because in order for democracy to function, then the competing ideas need to be aired in the public square so that people can respond accordingly. Now, the Conservatives, I mentioned the Conservatives a few times. I don't want people to get caught in the Conservative delusion. That's the belief that the Conservative Party is some sort of effective opposition to this sort of craziness. I mean, they're not. They've granted the whole hate crime concept, they've granted the hate incident concept. I mean, with regard to this hate speech legislation, Murdo Fraser's made some noises, expressed reservations about it. So have maybe one or two other Conservative MSPs. But the Conservative Party hasn't. Most of the MSPs haven't. When it comes to the sexist element, will any of them challenge that? My prediction, no chance. No chance. Partly because almost all of them can't even see it. And the few that do wouldn't dare to actually challenge it. 
Now, if you look at the government's own report on this, they say in their consultation, 90% of individuals who responded were against the whole idea on the grounds of freedom of speech, but 90% of the sock puppet charities mainly who responded to it were all for it. So you can see why the government funds all these so-called charities. If they didn't have them, the statistic would just be 90% of individuals were against it. End of story. But the government spends your money to pay organisations to parrot its own tune. So they can then say, but 90% of organisations were for it. Now, a freedom of speech issue recently has been the cancellation of venues that have had uh, Christian events booked in them. When this law comes through, it won't just be a matter of cancelling the venues. It will be a matter of charging people for expressing those views, whether it's within the church or within any venue. That's where the fight will move to. And that's a very serious issue. And we as the Scottish Family Party will fight it all the way. Now, the points I've made in this video, I'm making them here outside the Parliament. If these are the sort of points you'd like to hear articulated inside the Parliament, then you need to support the family party and help us to get MSPs in there to do exactly that. And the way to support us is to join us via the link below. Thanks for watching.